There are certain songs that you just like to sing along with, songs that are just kind of fun. The movie Singing in the Rain has a number of those. There's one. Good morning, good morning, we've talked the whole night through. Good morning, good morning to you. Do you know that one? Make your foot tap a little bit? Maybe a little bit. Anybody sing along with that? And of course, the one singing in the rain. Who can resist? Gene Kelly, you know? And if you're out in the rain, a little puddle there, I'm singing in the rain, just singing in the rain. You know, I'm not Gene Kelly. Okay, I get it. But, but you, you'd like to sing, don't you? It just kind of lifts your heart a little bit. But then there are other songs that just don't lift your heart. They are sublime. They, they lift your soul. One of the songs that I, I like so much is How Great Thou Art. That's just one. O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder, consider all the works thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. I love that song. It just literally lifts my soul up to the Lord. And so this morning, during the third week of Advent, which is called Gaudet Sunday, or Gaudet, which is Latin for rejoice, we're going to go to one of the greater songs in the Bible. It's Mary's song, the Magnificat, which is simply Latin for the beginning of my soul magnifies the Lord. So this morning, and I believe, every, did everybody get a handout? Should have been in your bulletin. So we're going to take a look at Mary's song. And almost like any song, there's a bit of an overture, a prelude to it. Then there are four stanzas. So we're going to start with the overture because songs always start with something before they get to the heart of it. So the overture. When we... Uh, when we come to Mary's story, Mary has been told by the angel Gabriel that she will conceive a son, she will call his name Jesus, and that Elizabeth is already six months pregnant. So Mary goes to visit Elizabeth. And we don't know how much uh, Elizabeth knows about Mary at all, about her pregnancy, probably none at all. Mary knows just a little bit about Elizabeth's pregnancy. But so Mary is going to go and she wants to meet her relative. Now I'm guessing when she comes up after traveling to visit Elizabeth, she didn't run up to her and say, Elizabeth, Elizabeth. She probably came up and said, hello, Elizabeth. But that hello received quite the welcome. Do you know how some songs, some symphonies, they start off with a clash of a cymbal? And you know with that sound of the cymbals that something's going to happen right then. That's how it begins. That's how it began right there in this overture. Because at the sound of Mary's voice, hello, the unborn John the Baptist in the womb, he leaped for joy. And it's not like he just like moved. You know how like babies kind of kick. It's like, he was like, whoa, something happened there. There was a leaping for joy. And then Elizabeth gives this kind of like in a song, it would be a fanfare leading into the song. And this is what Elizabeth says in her fanfare. She exclaimed with a loud voice, a loud voice, blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Wow, quite an overture to Mary's song, isn't it? Because Mary's song doesn't come out of nowhere. This is what builds up to it. So we're going to go into the first stanza here. This is from Luke chapter 1. And you've got it in your handout too, starting verse, verse 46. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked upon the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. When she says, my soul magnifies the Lord, 
it means that she praises the Lord. It's not that she can somehow make God greater than he is. God is already great. There is no greater than God. Now, we can praise people all we want. And sometimes we do praise people and we build them up and sometimes we even make them greater than they are. But this is not what Mary is doing. Mary is praising the Lord. She is exalting. She is glorifying in who he is. The Psalms, the Psalms were songs, by the way. They were meant to be sung. We don't have the music that goes with it, so we recite them. But Psalm 69 says, I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. Psalm 103 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and that all that is within me bless his holy name. Now, does that sound like one of the songs we sing on a regular basis? It should. There's a song called 10,000 Reasons or Bless My Soul. This is what that song says. Bless the Lord, O my soul. O my soul, worship his holy name. Sing like never before. O my soul, I'll, I'll worship your holy name. When we sing that, that's a direct echo from Psalm 103. So Mary probably had heard the Psalms. And so she is filled with God's word. And being filled with God's word, you naturally glorify God in this manner. And for those who are interested, by the way, Mary's song is similar in many ways to the song Hannah sings in 1 Samuel. I, I mentioned Hannah two weeks ago. She was without child and she cried out to the Lord and the Lord favored her with a child. And she gave birth to prophet Samuel. And she says in the beginning of her song, my heart exalts in the Lord. Some people speculate that Mary knew specifically of Hannah's song, so it was a, a, an expansion of that. Perhaps, maybe not. But when you are steeped in God's word, your language naturally uses some of his words to glorify God. So Mary starts off with this, my soul magnifies the Lord. It is a song of true thanksgiving. She gives the main reason for her thanksgiving in the very beginning. She says, for he has looked on, my humble, on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. Like last week, we talked about how God had favored Mary. God had graced her. God could have chosen anyone, but he chose Mary. And because he chose her, because he showered her with his grace and his love, she is blessed. It's not that she has some internal nature of blessed, blessedness, as some people say, that she can bestow her blessing on somebody else? No, she is blessed from the Lord. So we consider, her, we consider her truly favored by God, but not that she can somehow bestow blessings upon other people in that regard. See, in the song that Mary sings, Mary no, nowhere magnifies herself. It's always magnifying God the Savior. So now we go into the second stanza. The second stanza is this. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. In the second stanza, a part of a song that Mary sings, she talks about three different attributes of God. God being mighty, holy, and merciful. See, the one who has come to Mary, the one who has done great things for her, is the Almighty One. The one who by the power can command the universe to come into existence. By his word he says, let there be, and there is. He is the one who raises the dead to new life. He is the one who takes one who is spiritually dead and brings them to new life. This is the might of God. So you talk to a lot of people and they'll say, well, you know, I'm spiritual. I believe in this 
spiritual, kind of this higher being of some sort. But when they talk about this higher being of some sort, it's this, this vague thing. It's like the, you can pray to a tree or pray to a rock. But can that tree or can that rock do anything? Can this vague, whatever this is, higher being, command the universe to come to an existence? Can raise the dead back to life? No, Mary is talking about God Almighty and He, He has a name. And His name is Holy. Because holiness is the nature of God. He doesn't somehow have holiness. He is holiness. He doesn't somehow have this thing of purity. He is pure. He is righteousness in and of itself. He is all moral good. That is his nature. You say, you know, during, during our offerings, and I'll, I'll, I'll keep it up, God is good all the time, and all the time God is. We could actually say, even more, God is holy all the time. And all the time, God is holy. Because that's who he is. You cannot separate his holiness from him. That's who he is. That's his very nature. And because that's his nature, when you say his name, his name is holy. We say that every week. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What is hallowed? Hallowed is sacred, revered, sanctified, holy. Holy is his name. And that's why Mary sings that, because that is who God is. And he is also merciful. And without any irony, we thank God for his mercy. Because what is mercy? I've covered this number of times with you. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. You see, people don't understand this about God's mercy. They think he's just going to be merciful just for the sake of being merciful. But because God is holy and cannot stand the stench of sin, cannot have sin be in his presence, he judges sin. And his judgment is his wrath. The wrath of God is his judgment against sin and every single one of us deserve his wrath. See, a lot of people say, what am I saved? I, I'm saved. I'm going to go to heaven. I'm saved. Well, then I ask them, what are you saved from? You know what you're saved from? The wrath of God. Yet God is merciful. He doesn't desire that you experience his wrath. He desires you to be saved. And so for all those who fear him, call upon him. He will be merciful and withhold his judgment. And this is also why we celebrate Christmas. Because Christ is the mercy of God. Christ came to bear the wrath of God so that we wouldn't. This is what Christmas is about. God's mercy. In John, it says, John chapter 1, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of man, or the, not, nor the will of the flesh, or the will of man, but of God. This is Mary's song. This is why we celebrate Christmas. We celebrate for his might, his holiness, and his mercy. And we go into the third stanza. Third stanza says, He has shown strength with his arm and has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. And he has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. 
He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. Mary now really takes the second part of her song and expands it out. Expands it out to God's relationship with the world. And when she talks about he has shown the strength of his arm, we aren't to somehow think that God has arms or legs or eyes or things like that. I mean, a lot of people do that. The Mormons do that. They believe that God was a man and still is a man and has all the features of a man. As a, as a matter of fact, uh, a while ago, there was an expert, Walter Martin, and he gave a lecture against Mormonism. And a few Mormons heard that he was going to give a lecture and uh, they decided to attend. And about halfway through, they started to argue with him. They, they began using scripture to say, this proves that God is a man because the Bible refers to the right arm, the hand, the eyes, and so on of God. And Martin told the person to read aloud Psalm 17, 8, which reads, hide me in the shadow of your wings. And then he asked them, does that mean God has feathers? And they said, well, of course not. That's a figure of speech. And he said, exactly. So we aren't to think of that. We are to think the strength of his arm to talk about the nature, the attributes of God. So when we talk about the arm of God, what does it mean? It talks about his power to save, his might, the eternity of God, the holiness of God, the sovereignty of God. For example, in Jeremiah chapter 27, it says, it is I who by my great power and my outreached arm made the earth. With the men and the animals that are on the earth, I give it to whomever it seems right to me. That's the strength. That's the power of God. So, what does God do with his power? God humbles the proud and raises the humbled. In Mary's song, it says that with the proud, that God will scatter the proud in the thought of their hearts brought down the mighty from their throne, and later the rich will be sent away empty. Now I actually think the most dangerous verse in this whole song is this. Scatter the, scatter the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. See, when we think about somebody else, we, when we think about somebody being prideful in their heart, we think, well, that's somebody else. See, I think that's why this verse is dangerous. I'm, I'm humble. Let me tell you how humble I am. <laughs> I'm so humble. You've never met more someone, someone more humble than me. I mean, you, you've probably talked to some people like that who kind of keep going on about how humble they are. But what's dangerous is to somehow think that that verse doesn't apply to us to me. Because it doesn't say the proud of the rich and the famous and everybody else in their hearts. It just said the proud in the thoughts of their heart. See, you can actually only know the mercy of God when you're humbled. You can only know the grace of God when you're humbled. You can only know the true love of God when you're humbled. So it does apply to everyone. Now it does go on in the song also to apply then to those who are the rich and the famous, those who are sitting on the thrones. And nowadays we would talk about those who are the politicians, the esteemed of our days, the power brokers on Wall Street, the moguls, the tech giants, all of those people. God says, you know what? You're going to be nothing. You're going to be brought low. It, comes, it reminds of us of Ecclesiastes, right? Vanity, all is vanity. There's nothing new under the sun. It's all chasing of the wind. So in this wonderful aria that, that Mary sings, there's some dark notes in there that make us want to pause for a little bit, that make us want to reflect. But for those who are already humbled, who have already been brought low, there are some sweet words in here. 
that God will exalt those of humble estate and fill the hungry with good things. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read this particular section, it, it reminds me of Jesus and the Beatitudes. In Matthew chapter 5, it says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So in Mary's song, there's some very sweet words made full in Jesus' words in the Beatitude. And you find the favor of God given to those who have been humbled of his grace, his mercy, his steadfast love. This, this is a balm for the soul. So now we go to the fourth stanza. It says, For he has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring. So you know in movies, kind of near the end, how the, swing, the, the strings kind of swell a little bit and they just bring you into this very end of the song. This is to me like the, the strings just swelling in this beautiful, wonderful harmony, the symphony near the end. Another way I thought about it was um, a beautiful sunset night. You know, where you're sitting there, it's just this perfect temperature, a slightly warm breeze, no bugs, <laughs> right? It's a, it's a perfect night. And you see the sunset and all the reds and the oranges and the purples and the blues. And you almost hear nature singing that way. The sound of a sunset, if there was a sound of a sunset on a perfect night, that would be it. And your body relaxes and there's a calm. There seems to be a, a, almost a promise given of perfection on that day. This is Mary's song. She sings of the promise of God, the promise that was given to our fathers. So it would have been a promise to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Moses, that they would be brought out of slavery into the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey a land blessed by God. This is the promise that she sings in her song. To his offspring forever. It is an eternal promise, an eternal song. Because her song just doesn't go to the past, it also talks about the future. It talks about the future with Christ in heaven. And this song is made full, it is made complete in Jesus, Emmanuel. Do you remember what Emmanuel means? God with us. Do you remember what Jesus means? God saves us. God who came to be with us to save us from our sin. Listen to Revelation chapter 21, verse 3. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. That's the eternal promise for all who believe. That's the song Mary sings. How can your heart not hear those words and rejoice? You have to rejoice at Mary's song. My soul magnifies the Lord. How great thou art. How great thou art. And that is our word of rejoicing this day. Amen.